Welcome to the Big Screen Symposium podcast. This session is from the Big Screen Symposium held in Auckland on the 9th and 10th of July 2022. Some film clips played at the live event have been edited out of the podcast. In our opening keynote addresses, six creatives in roles integral to the filmmaking process respond to our theme, Mana Oaha, Creative Power. Composer Mahuya Bridgman Cooper, colorist Alana Cotton, costume designer Jane Holland, editor J. Biz Olsen, production designer Ra Vincent, and unit stills photographer Kirsty Griffin. Each share insight into their individual creative process and what Mana Oaha means to them. This session is presented by Screen Auckland. The speakers are introduced by event MC and actor Morgana O'Reilly. First, we're going to welcome Mahuya Bridgman Cooper, a celebrated screen composer whose work includes the score for Creamery, Mahana, an iconic Kiwi classic, Housebound. Just saying. And upcoming feature, Muru. And beyond the screen, Mahuya is a sought-after arranger and orchestrator, produces music for artists, and is a founding member of Black Quartet. But before we welcome him to stage, there is a, here is a little clip from his latest film, Muru. Mori na whanau, nga mihi nui kia koutou i tine ata. My name is Mahuya, and uh, what you just watched up there was an early edit of the opening scene to Muru, a film I recently scored, directed by the brilliant Te Arapakahi. Yep, whoop, whoop. Um, I wanted to play this because I love this film, and I want to shamelessly, shamelessly promote it, but it's also a good way <clears throat> for me to open this discussion on what Mana Oaha is. For this talk, I was asked to reflect on what mana, hoa, mana oaha is or creative power and what it means to me. <clears throat> and I thought that the initial process that I went through in developing the score for Muru captures this vibe. Steve Finnegan from Images and Sound very kindly put me forward as a potential composer for Muru. I was invited to go and watch the film before Te Arapa had agreed to work with me. So I went into Images to watch an early edit. I was there by myself, no one else. Uh, it was just me and an engineer who was running the screening. The film had a very profound impact on me in the way that all great films do. And afterwards, you just want to sit there in the dark, in silence, processing, digesting the whole experience. But at that time, since the film was still in, in an early cut with no credits, it just ended abruptly. The engineer flicked on the lights and asked me cheerfully, how was that? <laughs> uh, it was all I could do to hold myself together until I got to my car, where a wave of emotions took over. It was pretty full on, and I had a bit of a tonguey whistle moment in the car park. I then went straight home and did something I don't often feel that I have the creative license or mana oaha to do at that point in the process. <clears throat> I wrote a piece of music on the viola without any discussion or direction. For me, it's, it's really important to be able to at least speak to the director before starting a project or to, to start writing. The small cues and energy you get from a casual chat really help me when I try to imagine what they are hearing inside their head and what the potential music could, could be. A few days later, I met up with Te Arapa, his editor, the legend that is John Gilbert, to spot and discuss, spot the film and discuss the potential of working together. I nervously said, um, can I play you something? And play them this piece that I had written. There was a bit of silence, a few medium head nods, and that, that was pretty much it. <laughs> Neither of them said a whole lot to ease this very vulnerable bearing of my soul moment. <laughs> the opening that you just heard contains a small excerpt of that viola piece. And that piece became a thematic cornerstone for Muru and Rusty, the main character. For me, it's the underlying emotive glue that I feel is so important to telling stories that affect you deep in your core. 
I reckon this is what mana oaha is. The film affected me in a creative way so profoundly it compelled me to create something immediately to channel that energy into my discipline, hoping that I'd be able to continue that flow and communicate what I felt at that moment to other people. In film, music normally is the emotive driver, the ability to contextualize a scene, to play with tropes and stereotypes, with ingrained expectations and familiar memories that we collect as we have all grown and lived. The majority of us humans that use hearing is our second most influential sense. It's a powerful tool that can be easily overused or mishandled, pulling people out of a scene instead of consciously or unconsciously wrapping around you and pulling you deeper into the time and place where the story is being told. It's also super subjective. And because in our lifetime, we attach so many experiences to the sounds that happen along the way, we can feel very differently when those sounds or music is used in a way that is unexpected. I think that's one of the joys in film music, the ability to score something as, a, as expected or go against the grain in the hopes that the juxtaposition will create a more genuine, a more memorable, and a more connected moment. I'd like to leave you with the piece of music that I wrote. You'll probably need to close your eyes to picture Te Uruwera, home of Tuhoi. Imagine the mountains, the valleys, the rivers, all shrouded in mist from Hine Pukohurangi and your tamariki. Kia ora, thank you. so much, Mahoya. That was a beautiful, magical man. Um, next, we're going to hear from the wonderful Alana Cotton. Uh, she is a colourist who works on feature films, TV dramas, documentaries and commercials. Her recent feature collaborations include Fina, Juniper and Millie Lies Low. And for TV drama, The Luminaries, Black Hands and Creamery, here is Alana. Firstly, uh, e mihi ana te mana sinua, o tamaki makoto, nā te i whātua whānui, o te rā ngā wai o te watamata, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, ko Alana tuku ingoa, he whakatai kiriata taku tūranga mahi. Uh, kia ora e whānau. For the majority of you that don't know me, um, I'm Alana, I'm a colourist, and I'm used to uh, sitting in a dark room with a couple of people, not a crowd, so please forgive my nerves. <laughs> Um, as a colourist, I'm often asked exactly what my job is, and I could wax lyrical about balancing shots and directing the audience eye, but actually the answer is much simpler than that, and it's probably the same thing as yours. It's to tell a story, to serve the story, to elevate the truth of the piece. Authenticity, integrity, that's mana oaha to me. The only problem with truth is that there's always more than one way to tell the same truth. For example, if I were to ask you, what is the colour of fragility? What is it that you see? Is it the beige and almond tones of a dried leaf that cracks in your hand? Is it a soft cyan wash, reminiscent of glass? Is it feeling the texture of skin, seeing the inky blue map of veins running across an aged forearm? When you think of red, do you see danger? Or do you see lust? Is lust red? Or is it something else? 
So before, when I spoke about the texture of skin showing fragility and vulnerability, it can also show strength. And the funny thing about colour is that it's not something that we really see, but it's something that we feel. So how do we even know where to start? And how do we use that tool to harness mana oaha in our stories? Well, as I was saying, <laughs> it comes back to connection and truth. Working on Muru with Te Arapa, when we first started the grading process, we briefly looked at a cooler colour palette and we stripped the colour back a touch, bringing a nice level of attention to the film. But as soon as we placed it over our tamariki, we knew we had lost something. They had lost their glow, and they were the heart of the film. So that's not going to work. So we pushed the warmth back in and lifted it back up. But we were still missing something, something that grounded us and connected us to Tūhoi, to Tangata Whenua. We found our answer in Tame, and he became our thread. We sampled the colour of his moho, and we bled that colour into the shadows across the entire film. And the beautiful thing that happened was that the colour we placed beneath the pictures enhanced the greenery, the whenua, the beauty of Te And when I say we laid it across the film, I mean every single frame. And we, even when we're not in Te Uruwera, it's there, making it very clear whose story this is. Every frame connects us back to the people, to the land. To Tangata Whenua. If you look closely enough, I think a film tells you what it needs. An important piece of that for me is knowing where in a body the film sits. Are we grounded? Are we in the gut? Is it visceral? Or are we in the throat? If we're making a film about anxiety, what might be considered a darker subject matter, it might be tempting to take the grey to a darker, depressive tone. But actually, if we stop and think about what anxiety feels like, like I'm feeling right now, <laughs> It's the opposite, it's the antithesis. We feel exposed. And as much as we may want to hide, there is a feeling that we can't. So how can we put that into our grade? Well, I would pull the exposure up, up here. So we sit up high, right on the edge of breaking, because that's how it feels. And the key, this only works if the music sits up here as well. Collaboration. We all have to be making the same film. If I'm setting a tone up here, but the music is sitting down here in the bass notes, we lose our connection and we lose our power. Anyone who has ever sat in a room with me in a grade knows that I ask a million questions while we work, and that is because I'm constantly distilling. I'm looking for those little threads left by the many hands that have passed over it for me to pull out and weave back through. And there are always little clues left for me too. The lens that was used, the framing of a shot that sets a tone, the details in a costume that inform a character, or the texture of a location, how a cut sets a rhythm. I'll get the music for the composer and listen to it in the suite while I'm working. And I do this because all these pieces tell me the history, all the conversations that have happened before me. And these pieces guide the grade. And I love it when I'm wrong, too. I love it when someone comes in and says the complete opposite of what the pictures are telling me, because that's when something interesting happens. I worked on a short by Sian Elise White, shot by the wonderful Fred Renata, who also shot uh, Muru, Kotoro, Daddy's Girl. It opened with this beautiful image of Oahine, the lake's edge, and in my mind I've already graded it, with silvery morning light and brushed denim shadows. And in my mind I watch as she reaches into the deep, silky, sapphire blue lake and washes her face with the glassy, clear water. It's refreshing, cleansing, pretty. The way the cool morning light ripples against, over the water against the deep blue backdrops of the shadowed landscape surrounding her, I felt peace. I know the film, and this feels like a moment of serenity. It has been captured perfectly. Fred walks into my suite and says, black and white. But not high contrast black and white that would enhance the shape, the texture of the landscape, the droplets of water that fall from her face. Low contrast black and white. So Howard Morrison 1960s TV performance, black and white. I turn on the lights and we sit down and talk about the film. It's a film about dementia. And although we don't know that yet, and that character is away from that particular character and that space. She, in some ways, is stuck in time with him. It's her father. The black and white puts us back in time, and it's not an unpleasant place. It's soft, it's gentle, nostalgic even, sweet, until it's not. But Fred's framing changes that for us. And when her father slips into the present, we come with him, and the colour cuts in. And the funny thing is that not everyone notices that shift, but they feel it. 
and it's bold, we aren't subtle with the colour, but it happens on a cut, and it makes sense that we too, as an audience, can see as clearly as he can in that moment. And it's not until we drift away with him again that we understand the device. So we can be bold, but we have to be truthful. And I really do believe that art has the power to heal, to inspire, to educate, and even change minds. But in order to do that, we have to connect with our audience. So that is where I find my mana o aha, connection, truth. It's just that sometimes we have to be highly manipulative to tell the truth. <laughs> Gosh, amazing. Okay, next we have um, Jane Holland. Unfortunately, Jane is a COVID household contact person, so she's going to be zooming in. But Jane Holland is a costume designer and with a career spanning 30 years in film and television, her credits range from the expansive retro sci-fi world of Cowboy Bebop to character-driven period films like Juniper and World's Fastest Indian. She's also part of 10,000 Company alongside Michael Bennett, focusing on initiating and developing original scripts. Welcome, Jane. Kia ora tato um, There's a film, World's Fastest Indian, which was filmed in two halves, in New Zealand and in the US. <clears throat> it was made with two teams. I sent costumes to the US designer to fit on the lead character, Burt Munro, played by Anthony Hopkins, because the US part was shot first. Some pieces made it to screen, some were sent back. When Anthony arrived in Invercargill, his wife, Stella, who was his support and his team really, told me he was pretty much all set costume-wise. Like many actors who come with a legacy, he really was no fuss. Late in the shoot, the director suggested we change up a costume for the party scene. It meant a tight turnaround for the tailor, but it was Anthony Hopkins after all. And the day before the scene, I fitted a 1960s style suit. It was perfect. I look good, he said. And he did. He looked great. Hmm. Maybe a little too good. What do you think? Yeah, he was right. I talked it through with the director. He wanted Bert Munro to be scrubbed up for the scene and decided we could embrace the too good as a movie moment. The suit was approved. I set about aging it just to take the edge off, but a little too good was stuck in my head. I felt I needed a backup plan, so I rang Strangely Normal, the tailor in Auckland, with a huge favour to finish a suit that had come back from that first fitting months ago in LA. It was quirky, inspired by a photo of Bert Munro. I knew it needed a bit of work. We hatched a haphazard plan for Strangely Normal to work into the night and then leave the suit in a wheelie bin outside their workshop for the courier to collect at 5 a.m. By 10.30, I had the suit in Invercargill. I placed it at the back of the closet in Tony's camper, behind everything, just in case and laid out the now-aged, a little too good suit for him to dress. He was ready and happy, and then something happened. I don't know how he even knew it was there, but he reached to the back of the closet and said, why don't I wear this one? Didn't I try this in LA? I said, yes, but it was too heavy and not right. He said, well, it was so hot there, and now I'm here. I really needed the director to be part of this conversation. He was a drive away on set and waiting for his actor. I tried to stall, but it was too late. The jacket was already going on. And then in one of the great gifts of my career, Anthony Hopkins transformed right in front of me. He settled the jacket. He turned to the mirror and said, hello, Bert. Everything about costume design for me is encompassed in this moment. The difference between something that works and the magic of something that is just right. The tightrope of time and schedule and people. The choices that make all the difference. The fabric imported from England, too heavy for LA, so appropriate for 1960s in Ricardo. The surprise of a peak lapel on a single-breasted jacket. The importance of fit and context, the collision of people and character. I describe my process, my creative process, as an agitation. 
uh, in motion, always looking to be additive to the collective storytelling process, harvesting from the page, running with the director's vision, massaging synchronicity with the production designer, thinking about the interface with the cinematographer and tone and texture and play with light and feeding into hair and makeup for them to add their flair. I work with aesthetic and authenticity and people. Uh, at the heart is character and the actor. How can I add to the visual expression of what makes them tick, what they shout about, what they hide, and what lies just beneath the surface? For all the thought, the ideas, the research, the aspiration behind world building, I'm nothing without my team. My happy place is the workroom, a world of highly specialized artisans who interpret a drawing into flat pattern pieces and then turn two dimensions into three. Not only does a costume have to look good, but it has to function on a human body that moves in the most complex of ways to stand the test of time, of action, weather conditions, the rigors of filming, and to feel right. The creative inquiry drills down to um, <clears throat> what layers can I give an actor for storytelling possibilities? in the detail of a handmade button, the, the motif in a printed lining wrapping the actor in a memory, age and history worked into the folds, things that may or may not be seen on screen, but add to the collective character voice. Often, when I've done my job well, our work is invisible. Costumes are embedded, belonging to characters and of their world. In these days, when we are finally starting to embrace diversity on screen in real and not a gratuitous way, behind the scenes, the costume department is the lived-in embodiment of gender and cultural diversity. Pākehā cis males barely exist. Pretty much everyone has tertiary training, many with multiple degrees in postgrad. Why? Because the work is multifaceted, technical, specialised and skilled, Yet we are paid less than our counterparts in other departments, primarily because of, well, history. We are a department of predominantly women, but also because our, often our work is invisible. You see a row of women bent over sewing machines. It looks like factory work, women's work. You don't see the dance of their hands, the intricacy and exact nature of the work, the speed or the physicality of what they do. In a finished garment, you don't see how many individually calculated and sized pattern pieces make up a corset, or register the complexity of sculpted pieces for articulated hand armour, or have any idea how heavy fabric is when heaved between dye pots or consider the science behind the color in that dye pot. Often our work is invisible, yet our visual impact on a show is crucial. An actor in costume is often the world's first taste of a show. I will feel I have creative power when I know I am seen in the same way as my international counterparts, when my work is valued and therefore paid the same as other key creative HODs. And when I know the work my department does is valued for what it is and paid accordingly. Mana and power are not the same. I have the feeling that if our industry works, worked from the, place, the space of mana, issues such as visibility and parity wouldn't even exist. Somehow mana awaha is more aspirational than creative power and more accurately describes what we do. Mana awaha, expressive of that force within all of us creative beings to be additive to a collective vision on our quest for that moment of magic. Amazing. Now we're going to hear from Jabez Olsen. He is an editor with 20 years experience in the industry, a frequent collaborator with Peter Jackson. Jabez worked on an incredibly innovative documentary, They Shall Not Grow Old, and Disney Plus's recent series, The Beatles Get Back. Here is Jabez. Yeah. Thank you. 
Hi there. Yes, um, I'm Jabez, and um, I'll start with a little bit of background information about me. Um, originally, I was from Dunedin, where I went to university and got a degree in philosophy, which has been very useful. Um, <laughs> but I'd always wanted to make films, so I came up here to Auckland and attended the South Seas Film School, and that was around the end of the last century. Um, from there, I worked in post-production, in TV commercials, then on TV shows here in Auckland. And after that, I went to Wellington to work on The Lord of the Rings. Um, I've been down there um, ever since, except for the occasional couple of years away, uh, mainly in London on various projects, the last of which was cutting Star Wars Rogue One. And as uh, mentioned, um, my most recent project back in New Zealand was The Beatles' uh, Get Back, uh, directed by Peter. Um, so here are some of my thoughts about editing. The role of the editor varies from project to project, depending on the people involved and the type of project itself. Uh, in terms of storytelling, some of this is probably obvious. Cutting a feature film that has a script to follow is, of course, different than a documentary um, made of old footage. In the first, you've got a blueprint, and in the second, you've got to discover the story organically. Editing is the one part of the process that is unique to filmmaking. Everything else had its precursors before film. Acting and directing happened in the theatre and did long before cinema. Cinematography came from photography. Writing, music, costumes, set design, all have equivalents elsewhere, but only editing is native to cinema. And there's a saying um, that movies are written three times. The first is a screenplay, then again on set, uh, and then the third, for a third time in the cutting room. So the edit is the final rewrite, and often radical changes are made. Scenes get moved around, deleted, and even created in the cutting room. Whole storylines are reimagined, characters dropped, moments expanded, and with the possibility of digital effects, sometimes things are invented that had not even, uh, been planned. And, you know, it's a, both a blessing and a curse. Um, Editing is not about the equipment or how well you can use it. It is mainly storytelling, organisation and the management of relationships. The key one being between you and the director. The editor is the first fresh look at the material. They are the first to see what the film actually is and what it might be. As soon as an editor cuts shots together, they know something about the project that even those who are on set or have seen the rushes don't know. Now, that's exciting and it's a privilege, but it also causes real-world stress. Uh, like when a producer rings you up and says, does the footage work and can we destroy the set now? And you've got to make a call. <laughs> what? <laughs> Wasn't actually a joke, that one. <laughs> one of the main jobs of an editor is to protect the actors. Uh, in order for them to push themselves and try things, they need to know that someone has their back and is working with them on their performance. When cutting a film, there is macro and micro storytelling to consider. Micro editing is how shots go together. Which take is best? What shot size to use? How long should we hold on the shot for? Should we see the person speaking or the person listening? All the trimming and pacing of small moments. Then there is macro editing. Is the story working? Is this part too fast or too slow? Has the audience been told enough to understand this next scene? Have we told them too much? Would it play better with this removed or delayed later? Should we take this whole sequence and intercut it with those other scenes? This stuff is what makes or breaks a film. There is a fine line between not giving the audience enough information and giving them too much. You have to find the balance between over and under explaining. And the skill of the editor is to make an educated judgment call, and it's not always easy. I've usually been reluctant to talk about what goes on in the cutting room, and that's partly because I want it to remain a refuge for the director. A director should be able to relax in the cutting room and not have to worry about things being repeated. So much of filmmaking involves large numbers of people all asking the director questions. At least in the cutting room, they can get away from the demands as long as the editor creates the right environment. Many directors say that editing is their favourite part of the process, as that is where they can finally see it all come together and creative victories can happen quickly. Also, they have a couch to lie on. <laughs> but, but it is said that watching the editor's assembly can also be a director's worst day on a project. It's not necessarily the editor's fault, but the director just sees all the compromises and realities that differ from what their vision and plan had been. And sometimes it is the editor's fault. 
But, but from that moment, the editor and the director get to start making it better together. Directors usually like to see a scene the way they'd imagined it first before they are willing to consider radical changes. They have to get it out of their system and then new ideas can be presented. Offering up an idea to a director that they like and that they hadn't thought of, some new way of combining the shots that improves them, that is where the fun is and that's where the process becomes a collaboration. The ability of an editor, their level of talent, can be a hard thing to judge. Unless you are in the cutting room and know what material they had to work with, it can be hard to tell if they've done a good job. Sometimes a mere mediocre film might have been saved from being a disaster by brilliant editing. Or maybe there was an amazing film to be had and the editor's less than what it might have been. It's, it's hard to tell. But a good editor is someone with tenacious dedication. It's what all the best filmmakers have in common. Never resting, always looking for how the film can be better. Changing, tweaking, improving, up until the last second. Films are never finished. They're merely taken away from you. When I think in, of editing in terms of creative power, I think the term applies in four ways. There is the creative power of the editor in terms of their ability and talent. There is the creative power available to filmmakers today due to technology and equipment. In decades past, the process was so expensive that many had no power to try and be creative. Then there is the creative power inherent with money and power. Filmmaking is, after all, a business. And on different projects, different people might have the final say. The real creative power on a film might rest with the director, but it might just as easily rest with the studio or a producer. It depends who's really in charge and who has final cut. Sometimes you're just powerless to be creative. But the real, the real creative power of editing is the power to affect an audience emotionally with cinematic storytelling. It is being able to create something exciting, tense, comedic or dramatic through the combination of pictures and sound. The most rewarding part of editing a film is not attending premieres or getting good reviews. It's being in the cutting room, working on a scene, getting a story to work. It's bringing little moments together that can move people and create an emotional response in the audience. That's what editing is all about. Thank you. Thank you, Javis. That was amazing. Now, next, we have Ra Vincent. Ra's session was recorded yesterday as he is a household contact with COVID and is feeling unwell himself. We hope he recovers fast and we're grateful he recorded his session for us. Um, Ra started as a sculptor on the Lord of the Rings trilogy and he went on to be nominated for an Academy Award for his work as a set decorator on Hobbit, The Hobbit, An Unexpected Journey, alongside Dan Henner. And again in 20. 2020 for his production design on Jojo Rabbit. He was production designer on Thor Ragnarok 2017 and Ra's latest project, Thor Love and Thunder, is in cinemas now. So please welcome Ra's presentation. Tēnā koutou. Ko taranaki te maunga, ko te atiawa, te iwi, ko nati te fiti te hapu, or so, where does our drive for storytelling come from? Is that our experience of the world that inspires stories or a tendency to dream aloud? Maybe that experience is shaped in some part by our relationship to where we come from and the stories of our ancestors and their connection to spirit and one another. I feel like we have a unique knack for storytelling in Aotearoa. Whatever ethnic makeup, we've all been given this beautiful motu to explore and craft our stories on. I've been fortunate in my working life to have amazing support to use my own voice. As a visual artist, musician and production designer, I've learned that although production design is about helping somebody else translate their story, it's also important to have a style of your own. The best work always comes from that sense of creative freedom, mana awaha. Designing for film is much more about connecting people and their ideas than having your own private cool ideas. The way cast, costume, budget, locations and sets all fit together in a beautifully lit frame is production design. The responsibility to the medium involves caring about all of it 
I've had the pleasure of working across the world in my particular area of filmmaking, and there is a difference from being down here in the South Pacific. A great champion of Indigenous inclusion, Taika Waititi, often makes it mandatory to hire local, super local, descendants of the land that we're working on. You can feel the involvement of the Ugambe Aborigine people in Ragnarok, for instance. I'd like to see us get back to our rural communities, use the superpower we have in Aotearoa, which is our country's natural beauty, and an ability as a people to be adaptive, educate a new generation of filmmakers who are gleefully unaware of any restrictions on what is possible and make great stories. So maybe my version of storytelling has its roots in stories that have been told to me. Kia ora. Kia ora. Okay, our last keynote speaker this morning is Kirsty Griffin. Uh, she has worked as a unit stills photographer for the last two decades on beloved local films from Whale Rider to the critically acclaimed The Power of the Dog. I feel like most people in this room has probably seen Kirsty sneaking around a film set, snapping away. Um, she is a person of many talents. Kirsty is also an award-winning documentary maker with longtime collaborator Vivian Koenig. Welcome, Kirsty. Uh, kia ora koutou, um, nga mihi o te rā. Um, you don't sound like a tough crowd, so I feel okay and safe here. Um, when people ask me what they use my photos for, my usual answer is, well, you know when you're lying on the couch and you are looking through your favourite streaming program platform and you're trying to work out what to watch and you see a photo and you go, ah... Uh, Oh, it's got that dude on it, that might be all right, or, you know, it's a bit boring, or that looks really fantastic. Well, basically, that's the short answer. So I'm here to give you a slightly longer version. Primarily, I see my job is to attract the audience to your film, so they can't wait to see it when it's finally released. My aim is to condense and distill a scene into a readable image. Movement must be converted into stillness. The film still has a sense of time all its own. My creative process begins with understanding the story by reading and rereading the script. Once the actors begin to bring the script to life, the story slightly shifts for me. The most important still is the very first one released out into the world. It's called the first look image. This image has to do quite a lot of heavy lifting. I learned two very important lessons very early on in my career. Uh, the first was Whale Rider, my first feature film. No one told me what to do, they just said, Go and take some photos. So I went, there, went out, off I went, and I took some photos. And then at the end of the shoot, going sitting in the room with the producer and the publicist, I went through the collection of slides that I'd given them. And it was a great thing to do at that point in my career because this is the image that they decided to send out first. And I nearly didn't even hand this one in because it was, you know, you know I, I, I just took it. We were... Um, just finished shooting that scene when Paikia is giving her gut-wrenching speech to Kordal's empty chair and everyone's, you know. She finished the scene and the whole crew were just kind of silently weeping. And I just watched Keisha and I thought, oh, I wonder what she's going to do, this 11-year-old that's just done this amazing performance. And so she wandered off into the wings of the stage and she just started swinging around in her pew pew, and she had this faraway look in her eyes. And I wandered over and I just took three frames before the standby props guy came and took the cup away, and that was it. Moment gone. So I thought, I mean, I love the image, and I thought, but it's got nothing to do with what they were shooting. But anyway, I thought, oh, I'd better hand it in, it's pretty gorgeous. And um, that's what they chose. So that was, that was it. Finally, I knew what to do. You know, it was like. <laughs> So there it was, my job description. I was there to put my spin on the film as I saw it, my own unique interpretation to the larger vision of the film. So there we are, that was the first thing I learnt. And then almost 20 years later, in a very similar scenario, I had Benedict all to myself for a minute and a half, <laughs> and I shot nine frames, and only two of them, he looked down my lens. I said, okay, now look down my lens. And then someone was like, come on, Benedict, you've got to go. So 
I just, we just comp finished completing the scene and he was briefly free, so I just physically grabbed him away from the circus and said, stand there. And he went, here, here, I went, yeah, 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 that's good there. And so, you know, it was great. I, 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 um, the sun was right, his, the colour in the hills were perfect and the colour in the hills matches his face and his costume matches the tussock. And it all just was perfect, I thought. And that was it, 90 seconds gone. So to me, this says, this is Phil Burbank on his ranch. And looking down the lens like that is his, his challenge to his potential audience. You know, it's quite a, it's quite a good image for that. And when you, when you get a, a good image like that, you can use it in many different ways when you are marketing your film. So my second lesson I learned early on in my career was on River Queen. Samantha Morton made me cry. It's true. <laughs> we, were filming, <laughs> we were filming on a wild Taranaki beach. The surf was so loud and the wind was so outrageous, even the boom op was blowing down the beach. And she could hear my camera click. And I went, oh, God. Anyway, after a very, very embarrassing moment, I skulked up into the sand dunes, tried to pull myself together a bit, and I could hear Barbara Dara, the costume designer, trying to make herself heard over this howling wind. She's like, come back. She's wearing her blue dress. I was like, I can't. But I did. And that was it. At that point, um, Samantha was more than just a person in a frock. This frock represented a whole team of people, a creative force, and as Jane says, the incredible invisible. So that, that is my motivation to do a good job, is to celebrate the artistry and the expertise of these amazing people that, that I work with. Their attention to detail is, is phenomenal. So clearly, Samantha and I never got to have our moment. The only close to intimate moment I had with her, she was blindfolded. So perhaps we should have tried that a bit earlier. Perhaps I should have worn a blindfold. Don't quite know how that would have worked, but this ended up being the poster. <laughs> well, one of the posters, but that was the only sort of moment. We actually had quite a normal conversation while she was blindfolded. So, you know, it, it is... You know, clearly it's a relationship between me and the cast and the actors, and if that falls apart, you're fucked. <laughs> it has happened a few times, not a lot, but anyway. I am a lot better at it these days. You have to be pretty broad-shouldered. You know, no, no illusions about your role in the filmmaking process. You need to be very aware of what's going on around you, what the crew need to do to achieve the shot. I tend to have one eye down my viewfinder and the other on what the camera and the grips, the three cameras, the cranes, the steady cam, the Ronin, what all those dudes are up to, because they are pretty much all dudes. And then, you know, so I've got to fit in around them and, you know, often it's, it's getting really tricky these days. But mainly I need to understand what's going on for the actors within the scene, what their character is up to, what their presence of mind is and when to actually walk away. The very, very best part of my job is watching some very fine performances up close. It's such a privilege. So clearly to do my job well, I need to have a relationship with the cast and that takes time. And to get a really good shot takes time. When it comes to marketing your films, I feel very much part of the creative team. I have a fair idea of a scene or if a particular shot could potentially be used for posters and for, you know, what other media. And this is always in the back of my mind when I'm photographing. Well, you see a moment that you think could be used for the poster or for key art. And some, some marketing teams on um, films have pretty distinct ideas how they want to market your film. And so sometimes I get nothing but a sketch of stick figures. That's very helpful. But then sometimes I get a 30-page glossy brochure. And um, yeah, so that, that sometimes you have to do quite sort of formal setups to achieve the actual message that you want to get across, because this isn't something we could have shot on set, but we did a setup afterwards. And then some images that you, you shoot in some of the very least expected situations and, and they become a bit of key art, which is quite, it's always good to see them used. But on a personal level, what my job has that is unique to any other position on the film set is 
I capture the truth. I capture reality. The real events, the real events of this world that we inhabit. This is what sustains my creative drive. I prefer the quieter moments when the actors are just getting ready on a low-budget New Zealand film, you know, or when the cast are just kind of getting into their roles or getting ready to go on to set. I mean, these are the these are the bits I like. I don't. I get a bit sick of all that rape my rig blokey stuff that goes on. It's really uninteresting. We all know what a camera looks like, right? This is the stuff. This is the stuff that no one really gets to see, and that's my my job is to capture that and document the creative art of fiction. Um, and then moments between the cast and the directors. I always quite like that. It gets pretty intense. A lot of hand things going on, <laughs> and you know the attention to detail. Look at all the hands that it takes to actually get things ready for them to film. Often, when you're looking at behind-the-scenes photos, you think there's like two blokes and a camera, and maybe a light. That's not. <laughs> there's all this amazing stuff that that goes on that is so tender and so detailed. So yeah, these are the people that motivate and inspire me every day. Is the, it's just the clever people that we work with on set, and um, highly skilled. And um, good luck to you all. <laughs> Matewa. The Big Screen Symposium 2022 is brought to you by Script to Screen. We are grateful to our event partners, the New Zealand Film Commission, New Zealand On Air, AUT, Images and Sound, and Te Māngai Pāho. Voiceover is by me, Anna Corbett, and music by Poddington Bear.